Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are going to build a water purification plant. Now, you're probably thinking, Echo, that's not really a thing. Well, it kind of is. We actually have two buildings built into Ani that do it for us. One being a water sieve, the other being the trusty desalinator. One cleans salt water into regular water, the other cleans polluted water into regular clean water. So why are we sweating about it when we have these two machines to do it for us? Well, it's because we're starting to run low on sand. Right now we have about five tons, and while I was editing the last video, I noticed, uh-oh, we're getting a little low. So we've put in some stopgap measures until we complete our water purification center. Namely, I started turning ceramic into sand. Now, using the rock crusher, it takes 100 kilograms of ceramic and you get 100 kilograms of sand back out. Let's do another 50. And that seems to be a very expensive proposition considering the kiln creates ceramic, but it takes clay and coal. Well, we have enough coal. Right now we're sitting at over 3,000 tons. Is that a megaton? Is that three megatons? Okay, it's not a megaton. Apparently a megaton is one million tons. So regardless, we have over 3,000 tons. The second ingredient of ceramic though is clay. It takes 100 kilograms of clay. If we go up to our trusty deodorizer, we can see it takes just over 133 grams of sand per second, and it actually gives you back 143 grams per second. And the reason why it's giving us a little extra material is because it also requires 100 grams of polluted oxygen. But the medium story short, it's actually a sand positive process turning clay back into sand. We're gaining another 10 grams per second of sand every time we destroy the clay. And I say destroy the clay, but, but more accurately speaking, it's actually taking the 100 kilograms of clay, turning it into 100 kilograms of ceramic. So the only negative of this process is we're actually losing coal. But like we said before, because we were running hatches so long, we we're sitting at over 3000 tons. So it's not a big deal if we sacrifice some of it to get more sand. But this isn't something I want to continuously do. First, because it takes manual dupe labor. And second, because it's not infinitely sustainable. We'll eventually run out of coal and we would not be able to get any more unless we started running hatches again. So what are the colony's major requirements for sand? Well, it's not a lot. It's the water sieve, which uses one kilo per second, and the deodorizers. But we've already shown that we can actually make more sand out of what the deodorizers consume. So I'm not too worried about them. But it is high in time to get rid of the water sieves. And right now we're running one in our main base to destroy the carbon dioxide. We're running another one to clean polluted water in order to feed our sleet wheat farm. And third, we're using one to clean polluted water to feed our electrolyzer setup. Also on the home front, I wanted to show you guys that the experiment proved itself true. The heavy watt joint plates do actually overload. You can see right now we're clipping right over 20 kilowatts on the heavy watt conductive wire, which is fine for the conductive wire and the conductive joint plates, but the standard heavy watt joint plates can only take 20 kilowatts which means it's time to brick all this thing in and get to work on replacing these. All right, we've built back our tiles and put a little bit of petroleum right here so it should maintain that perfect liquid lock. Now all we have to do is go in here and destroy everything and we should be left with a vacuum. Now the only bad thing that could happen is if the steam overrides the petroleum and it would break the lock and we'd have to do it again. We were laughing about this in the last episode. This one's even funnier. Look at that tiny glob of petroleum. And yet it's keeping this entire area locked. So beautiful. And we're done. Now we just got to carefully deconstruct some of these tiles and we can get on with the business of building our water purification plant or center. I'm not really sure which one I want to go with yet. And I'll explain why in a minute. And there we go. She's such a thing of beauty. Well, at the minimum, she's better than the modified Y-Splitter junction here. Speaking of which, our cold power brick is doing amazing. My only sort of complaint is that, well, Sweepy leaves a lot to be desired when you compare him to such AI achievements as Rover. For some reason, Sweepy always ends up only sweeping up the polluted ice, and I think it has to do with the fact that polluted ice is the first material he comes to, so Sweepy just continues to pick up more polluted ice. So here, not a lot of the carbon dioxide actually gets to be picked up. Not a huge deal, just an annoyance. 
these two sweepies on the natural gas generator, they taken care of all the carbon dioxide here. So we're not at risk of running out of carbon dioxide by any stretch of the situation, especially considering we still have 11 tons in this pile, still sitting at minus 90 degrees. So earlier I mentioned the water purification plant versus the water purification center. I'm going to try to explain what I'm thinking and maybe I'm going to help convince myself which is the way we're supposed to go because right now I'm drawing a blank. If we were to build one giant water purification plant here, we could use this volcano as the heat source. Not a big deal and it takes care of a couple birds with just one stone. Not really any additional power requirements, just sort of dripping in the magma whenever we need it. The problem is then all the liquids from all across the colony have to come directly into this one plant. And remember, the more pipes, the worse your performance on the game is going to be. And we're already not shy of using pipes. Now on the flip side, we could take every geyser and treat it as a sort of water purification center. And we could deal with every geyser individually and then send its clean water where it needs to go. Now the methodology would be simple, except the heat would be coming from a thermo aqua tuner in order to boil the water and take care of all that business. So we would be paying an additional power cost. The water starts here and we'd only have to deliver it. In our water purification plant, we actually have to deliver the water to be purified and then deliver it again once it's clean, which means almost double the amount of pipes. See the conundrum there? Of course, now that I'm looking at it, we're transporting this water all around the base already. So would we be actually be adding that many more pipes by bringing all the water here and then sending it off? And furthermore, how many pipes does it take to actually reduce the performance in the game? And if we do decide to do in the centralized area, utilizing this volcano for the heat source, we'd have to be much more careful than we've done in the past. What I'd probably end up doing is walling this whole place in, vacuuming it out before we even started to dig into this volcano area. Now I'm kind of regretting getting rid of the last of the stone hatches. I really hope we can find hatches on another planetoid. That's something I have to keep in mind. Hatches and plants and things like that, if you destroy all of them, like we just did with hatches on Drino, there's a chance there's not going to be any more. In a normal game, we can just rely on it eventually coming back out of the printing pod. But our printer pod only spits out dupes and not other things. This is definitely one of the advantages of live streaming when you're playing because I could get the input from the community immediately. Hey community, should we go option one or option two? And we'd have an answer pretty quickly. Now we all know how streaming chat works. It's not always the correct answer, but at least there'd be an answer. All right, we're gonna be decisive and make the decision. We're gonna go with the water purification plant. Now this outline here is probably not gonna stay forever and ever. It's only here for temporary to make sure that none of this heat leaves this room. We'll drop all the very hot materials down here once this area is vacuumed out, bring it over to the old item unlocker slowly this time so that way we don't overheat our conveyor loaders. And once we're finished with all that, then we can start building the water purification plant. And this is going to be our liquid lock. That's right. We're actually going to use some of our iso resin. We're up to 319 kilos, so I figured, hey, let's bring out some visco gel. And I can tell without even going to look at Stencola, our resin production is doing a lot better. We're getting one of these interplanetary payloads over from Stencola every couple cycles, and it's packed full with 100 kilos of resin. And that's primarily because we have 126 Paku sitting in our infinite Paku tank. And it's a good thing, too, because... Our tree loves to eat its fish fillets. Now, if you've never worked with visco gel, there's nothing to be too alarmed about. It's not some special sort of thing that's magical. All right, who am I kidding? It's absolutely magical. That's why they call it visco gel. And as you can see, based on the properties and the name, the visco stands for viscosity. In other words, it doesn't spread out very well. In fact, almost none at all. Here we have 120 kilos of visco gel and it just locks in these two areas. Now we're gonna do the same here, and then we'll have our tunnel with two visco gel locks. We can vacuum out the center, and none of the heat that ever happens in here will ever escape out here. Now, this is only a precaution because we're vacuuming this out too, so there shouldn't be any heat here, but you know how it goes, so we're gonna do this just in case. Before we close the book on visco gel, I wanted to give you a couple more tidbits of information. 
unless you're working in a high temperature area, heat is normally not a factor. Visco gel can go all the way up to 479 degrees. And at that point, it doesn't turn into a gas. It actually just turns into a naphtha. Now it's time to vacuum the place out. And this time, we're not going to make the mistake we did in the last episode with vacuuming out the cold power brick. We're just going to put a lot of gas pumps in here. Now, because we have so many gas pumps, it's going to require a little bit of extra power. So we're going to throw down a temporary large power transformer. Since this is just the first step, I'm not even 100% sure what the final power requirements are for the water purification plant is going to be. So we finished vacuuming the place out in record time and now I've started digging out the area. We're gonna leave the volcano contained for a little while until we are ready to handle the volcano. Which reminds me, I really need to get in there and analyze it because chances are it's gonna go dormant right when we need it to work. Now the good thing is there's plenty of magma in here to get us started, but still. So this is my life now. Thor takes his time when figuring out what task to do next. A lot of our duplicates are acting like this, but Thor is even more so. You could see right there, it was a solid five or six seconds between tasks for him. And we're only at cycle 1711. I'm gonna have to do some serious optimization to this colony, and that way we can extend its life past cycle 1711. I mean, there's so much more we want to do. We have so many more planetoids to explore. So how hot is it really in here? Well, this is liquid lead. I started getting a little nervous because I was like, uh-oh, when does that turn into lead gas? Luckily for us, we still have about 200 degrees before it would do that. Because if we had an environment fill this area up, it would quickly melt this visco gel, break this vacuum, and then melt this visco gel. It would just be bad news bears. All right, we've made a little progress. We're starting to build the frame of the magma dropper. Basically, what's going to happen is we're going to bore a hole in here and figure out some sort of magma blade that'll work and turn this entire area into the purification center. And the good news is working in that environment only caused one near fatality. Old Star-Lord decided to stay in the magma a little bit longer than what doctors recommend. Okay, maybe there was more than one injury. It's about this time that I wish we had a slightly larger ER. If the dupes are just waist deep inside of the magma, it's not too big of a deal. It's when they're fully submerged where they really start taking on the pain. Lucky for us, we don't have much more work to do under here. Now we want to double insulate everything that's actually touching magma. So we still have a little bit more work. And then eventually we're going to have to bore in wherever side that we decide to do the dropper on. While the dupes are working on that, I have to update you on a small change to our food chain. If you remember, all the slickster eggs used to come down here where they would eventually turn into meat. The problem is, if a dupe came over here and said, hey, I need to go load up an incubator, they would grab an egg, and if something happened in the meantime, well, they would drop the egg. Normally what would happen is they ran out of suits that are filled with oxygen. Because we've been so busy lately and have a lot of projects outside the base, well, our Atmos suits aren't exactly staying full. This isn't a big deal, except eventually those eggs would be hatched if I wasn't paying attention. Then we'd have slicksters running around here, dropping oil everywhere, and it was just a big old mess. For the stopgap, I just put this conveyor loader in, so if I saw an egg here, I could sweep it, and this auto super would grab it, put it in this conveyor loader. Oh no, who's burning now? Ah yes, it's Hulk. It's alright, nothing a little... Neosporin won't help, a couple bandages, you'll be fine. Just please finish those insulated tiles. One more tile, buddy. You got this, and then I'll give you all the medicine you need. So as I was saying before Hulk interrupted us with his personal problems, we're no longer going to drop eggs down into this area. Instead, we've built a meat factory here. And this way, the duplicates only need to grab the eggs from here and put them right in the incubator. So if they're already out here, they already have the Atmos suit on, so chances are they're going to be able to deliver it successfully. If they do happen to drop it out here, no big deal. We often have extra critters around here. And then eventually these will hatch, magically transform into meat, and then this auto sweeper will throw them in this conveyor loader for delivery down to our kitchen. All right, we have the basics of our magma dropper in, and here's how it's going to work. We're going to have a dupe run in here and hold his breath and cross their fingers to make sure they don't die, and dig out these two tiles here. Once they get done digging those out, the magma will naturally flow down here. And remember, a magma blade naturally has a 10 tile length, which means the very end of the magma blade will be able to control with this mechanized airlock. 
When we're ready, we can open up the airlock. It'll drop a little bit of magma in here. And since it's touching this beautiful diamond temperature shift plate, it'll instantly solidify the magma into igneous rock. And because there's no other spot for the igneous rock to bounce out to, it'll bounce out here. So that's how we get hot igneous rock inside of this area. Now we have to figure out how we're gonna get all the water in here, siphon it out, and move it. Okay, so here's the general idea. Once we have this area all nice and heated up, we're gonna be able to drop water into it. Water will then turn into steam, and we'll have a bunch of steam turbines on this level here. The steam turbines will then pump its output into a water tank. Now this water tank is not gonna be a forever water tank, it's just sort of an intermediary in order to take all that water and bring it somewhere else, which we'll also need to make sure that it's nice and cool as well. So there we have another super coolant run. I've also broken back into this area. There's no reason for it to be sealed off since all the materials are gone. We did have one or two pieces left. Uh, so the temperature in here is a little warm, but nothing too bad. And I think our intermediary water tank is gonna go all the way over here, which if I make some more room, we may be able to keep the Gravitas buildings. I know it's weird. I like keeping them. Let's just move on from it. It also means this cool steam vent sort of in the way what I think we're going to end up doing is just dumping all that water in here when we're ready. Actually, it's already clean, so we could just dump it into this tank and then put an appropriate cool steam vent tamer on here. There are still some questions that we need to contend with. For instance, how are we going to get all the water into here? Now, I'd like it to where it's close to the heat source as possible, so I'm thinking a row of liquid vents here. And that way we have upgradeability and we can continuously throw more and more pipes into it as we need. Now you'll notice that we're keeping our visco gel liquid logs here. And the reason why is because it shouldn't matter. This whole area will be steam, but it won't be hotter than 479 degree steam, which means these visco gel liquid locks should hold like a charm. I want to take a quick break and show you how well the Stinkolo Paku farm is doing. There are times when the tree actually can't keep up with the amount of Paku filet coming in. It's such a thing of beauty. Because of it, we now already have a half a ton of iso resin and more is on its way. And that number is only going to get bigger and bigger until we have all the insulation and visco gel needs met. Now the last thing we need to get is niobium. But that's a trick for another episode. So we have our liquid vents in, and this is sort of going to be the methodology. The nasty liquid's going to come in, whether that be polluted water, salt water, brine, no matter what it is, will come in here and get superheated. From that point, it turns into steam. The steam turbines will grab it, dump it off into this tank here. And there's going to be a bunch of pumps on this level, and that's where we do the actual filtering out to the rest of the base, wherever needs water. Now, there are some locations that we actually need polluted water, not clean water. Case in point, the thimble reeds. So what we're going to do is put these liquid reservoirs in, and we'll have this cool slush geyser filter all of its water past these liquid reservoirs. It'll fill these liquid reservoirs, and then the rest will take off down to the water purification plant. Okay, now that we have this steam vent in the open, we definitely need to seal it off rather quickly. And we'll just build up here like this. And until we're ready to actually tame it, we'll just seal it off and that'll be that. So we're gonna end up moving the entire thing over by one tile. The problem I was running into is it wouldn't have been symmetrical on the steam turbines. And then I started twitching and shaking, so we ended up having to move it. I think we've broke Sweepy and Sweepy's friend. They don't move very often. Come on, buddy, you can do it. You can do it. He doesn't want to do it. He's not moving at all. He still has plenty of battery. It's just the simulation is at the point where some of the minor things are starting to go wrong a little bit. So here's the basic steam turbine setup. Nothing too abnormal. We have one thermal aqua tuner over here that's going to keep all these steam turbines nice and chilly. Where we separate from convention, though, is all the steam turbine output is gonna head back into this tank. And because we don't want any sort of bottleneck, we actually have two output pipes. We have three steam turbines on one and three steam turbines on the other. And they'll drop all of that nice and clean purified liquid all down here. Besides the other hundred construction tasks that we have queued up, we have one more and this one's rather significant. Steam has a tendency to change temperatures very quickly. In other words, the steam down here it's going to be nice and hot, but by the time it got up here, it wouldn't be as hot. Now, we have both thermo aqua tuners to kind of assist with that, but we needed a way to transfer temperature from here all the way up here. 
And you know what that means. It's time to get building a bunch of temperature shift plates. Now before we do this, I need to look at materials. Now I'm already grabbing all the granite we have off of Stinkola and sending it back over here because it's about time for us to permanently go colonize another planet and get all of its other materials here. Right now we're down to 239 tons of granite, which I know kind of sounds a lot, but considering most of our insulated gas pipes and insulated liquid pipes, not to mention all of our insulated tiles use granite. And at 800 kilos a pop, this is no inexpensive task. Now it'd be great if I had enough diamond to do this entire thing in diamond temperature shift plates, but quite frankly, that'd be a waste. Granite will do good enough. The only place that really matters is down here where the temperature is actually taking off from the igneous rock that'll be in this platform. So I think what we'll do is throw a couple of diamond temperature shift plates to get us started, and then we'll transition into the granite. Well, I'll see you guys in about 40 or 50 cycles when the dupes finish all of this. I wanted to show you a quick secondary benefit of purifying all of our water, not through a sieve. Since the beginning of the game, we started spreading around just a few food poisoning germs here and there. And by a few, I mean a lot. So as you can see, every tile here has over 4 million germs. What's worse is this is the polluted water that's actually feeding our oxygen supply. So if you look in our base, there's quite a lot of food poisoning germs inside the oxygen. Now this isn't a huge deal because we have an entire box full of curated tablets that, yes, also have food poisoning on them, but they cure food poisoning, so it's okay. And the reason why this works out is because food poisoning has a temperature range of minus 25 to 75. Outside of that range, it kills the food poisoning germs. So all the water will come in here, get boiled into steam, and all those food poisoning germs will die. I realized before, I think we forgot to mention the water sieve that filters our bathroom water. Now this is not going to matter in the future because we're going to be purifying this water as well. Because we won't be using this specific setup for bathrooms. Every dupe will have their own bathroom inside of their custom built dupe condo. Now there are a lot of locations in our colony that have polluted water heading towards them and then we individually sieve them. Here's another one up here, which provides the clean water for our rocketry program. It's for this reason, I think it might be easier to just have a main clean water bus and a main polluted water bus. So I think step one is going to be getting rid of all this polluted water, which is just going to be a case of flipping the bridges. We'll disconnect it here and then flip this bridge here. We'll then make this line here into our polluted water runoff. And then we got to put another line in here that is going to be our clean water supply. And that way, everywhere that needs clean water can take off of this main pipe. Unfortunately, we have a lot of spaghetti everywhere, so we're going to have to move some stuff to the side. I'm also going to switch up the automation that's controlling this door. As it sits, whenever the temperature gets low enough, this door will open and start dumping magma. For our use case, it'll stay open for too long. We don't want to wait until it gets warm enough then the door shuts, there'll be too much magma in here. So what we're gonna do is throw a timer sensor here and an AND gate. And that way the door will only open for a couple of seconds and then shut, and it'll wait an entire cycle until it has a chance to open again. Now luckily we can do this without even breaking in. We're just gonna snip right there, throw an AND gate right here, except we're not gonna make it out of lead. I think that would be bad, Juju. Oh yeah, that looks good there. Here's our magic timer, again, not out of lead and then we just wire it back up. Now that it's complete, we're gonna set this thermal sensor at 185. In other words, if it's colder than 185, we're gonna want this door to open, but we're gonna only want it to open for, to start with one second every half a cycle. And we'll see how this works once everything gets running and we may have to tweak these figures just a little bit. Now, this is definitely an odd bug. I'm not sure how it's happening, but we keep making more and more dirt. And unfortunately, Wonder Woman is stuck. Now, the only thing that's probably making sense is, well, all the algae coming through here, it's just too hot for the algae. So it pipes out and then makes a pile of dirt. Unfortunately, this is going to be bad for Wonder Woman unless we get this fixed. For now, just to prevent any more dirt from forming, We'll just separate the shipping, and now hopefully somebody will come rescue Wonder Woman. 
Yep, that's definitely a new one for me. And by looking at the database, you can see that algae does turn into dirt at 125 degrees. Now, why is it turning into dirt here is the question. Why is it so much hotter here than anywhere else? The petroleum going through here is 62 and a half. This rocket hasn't taken off in quite some time, so we're just gonna throw more algae at the problem and hopefully it corrects itself. Because the more algae you spin there, the cooler these rails should end up getting. Otherwise, we're just gonna build the Great Wall of Dirt. We're now gonna go ahead and fill up our cooling loops. We still have a little bit more of the temperature shift plates to go, but we might as well get the coolant flowing. Now we have two distinct cooling runs. One is for the steam turbines and only the steam turbines and the other is for the water that's going to maintain in this tank. We want to make sure it stays at that good room temperature between 20 and 25 degrees. And we're going to send these on with the standard bridge, and we're going to make sure that our thermo aqua tuners are off. We don't want these thermo aqua tuners running for a couple of reasons. One, there's no atmosphere in here yet, but two, we want to make sure we're filling up the loop properly. Now being is that the coolant loops themselves aren't going to be getting very cold. In fact, we don't want this water colder than, say, 20 degrees. And the same thing for the coolant on the steam turbines. There's really no reason for them to be any colder than what we want the general atmosphere to be. Now that we have the coolant starting to flow and we have a good bit of the temperature shift plates in, I think it's time to open this up and get some heat flowing. Now, before we can let any water in here, especially any polluted oxygen or anything else that's gonna off gas and break our vacuum, we need to make sure we break into here, start our magma blade and then seal this up. So we'll start by issuing a deconstruct command here and here. Good luck dupes, it's gonna be a little warm. Now we're gonna make sure somebody finishes off the ladders and then pick up their mess. You might wanna hurry up there, Star-Lord, it gets a little toasty and we really do need them to to pick this debris up because as soon as they do we're going to be sealing this in and hopefully we'll never have to get in there again. I also need to put one more insulated tile here so the magma blade comes out correctly. We actually don't want this double filled with magma. That's not what we're looking for. We'd waste way too much magma if it was staying like this. Now we're finally sealed up so this is going to maintain its vacuum. Now we can start letting the water flow. But before we put any water in here, we want to make sure it's not going to be polluted water. Because we don't want this whole thing filling up with polluted oxygen and then it'll start gumming up the works when we do finally have the steam in here. The idea is that once we have enough steam in here, you can put all the polluted water as you want because there won't be enough pressure available for it to off gas. So what I think we're actually gonna do is throw down a bunch of bottle emptiers and just dump some clean water in here. The one pipe that we have ready is actually coming from this polluted water tank here. And eventually we're gonna move all this around to where it's nice and clean. But the idea is all of our intake waters are gonna come in here. And then whenever we need water, we'll just tap into these pumps here. And you'll notice that we put one extra lip here. In the unfortunate event that somehow this room gets too cold and all this steam starts turning into liquid water, we don't want it to come above the area where the visco gel is. Mixing the two is guaranteed to have bad results, so we'd rather just keep them separated. Amazingly, the dupes are almost finished with the temperature shift plates. So impressed with your abilities there, dupes. I think we're actually gonna move the bottle emptiers too once we're finished. And that way, all the bottle emptiers drop to the hottest place that there is. Now, hopefully all this will eventually equalize, but right where this igneous rock is coming out is going to be the hottest, and it's where it's gonna be the flashpoint for the whole thing. So any extra liquids that we have around the colony that we need to dump, we'll be able to dump right here. We're getting so close. I'm so excited to bring some very hot igneous rock onto this situation. The water's barely over this tile, which is fine. Now all we're gonna have to do is flip this to the right level. So if it is below 185 degrees, we're gonna want that door to open. And then we'll just reset this timer just to open it for a second. Perfect. You'll notice that the, as soon as the magma came in here, this area is cold enough to turn the magma into igneous rock and the igneous rock is sitting right here. Now, igneous rock is not the greatest conductor. It only has a thermal conductivity of two and a specific heat capacity of one. So it will take a second to get this temperature shift plate all nice and warm, but it will eventually happen. You'll notice the liquid in the tile is going up in temperature, but just not very fast. And that's because it has to heat all of this liquid plus these temperature shift plates. So it is gonna take some time to 
in order to drain all the heat out of this igneous rock. In fact, just to help it along, we're gonna put a steel liquid tepidizer in its place, and this way it'll preheat all of this liquid a little bit quicker, okay, a lot of bit quicker than what the igneous rock will do. The igneous rock's job is going to be to maintain the temperature. So the liquid tepidizer has done its job and brought the area around to 85 degrees. Oh, I have an idea. Let's put a shipping rail in here and just a bunch of conveyor rails. That'll get the place moving. Now, this is going to be an absolutely gross waste of steel, but it's really going to cut the time in half. And to tell you the truth, it'll actually help keep this box nice and warm. And this is actually a decent idea because it's going to really help pass the temperature around this entire room and take all that temperature out of the igneous rock so when we want to use it, it'll be down to a hundred and something degrees. And you may be thinking to yourself, uh, Echo, you're not going to have any steel left after this. We're going to have plenty of steel. Before we started this, we were at over a hundred tons and we have plenty of backlog. I even stopped steel production for a little while just to make sure the dupes can concentrate on this project. Once we kick steel production back on, since we're not hurting on iron or lime, our steel numbers will go right back up there. Oh yeah, this is just gross, isn't it? We're down to 50 tons of steel and I guess we'll drop it all right here. Nice little conveyor chute. Perfect. All right, dupes, get back to work. Even before we're able to get the reels completed, we're getting really close for this water to burst into steam anyways. It's right around 100 degrees. Igneous rock is doing its thing. As soon as we're able to get it on these rails, though, it'll be very quick indeed. And this is good anyways, because it'll help preheat some of these temperature shift plates. But the real meat and potatoes will come when the igneous rock is transferring around these rails. And yes, I accidentally turned the thermo aqua tuner on inside of a vacuum and bad things happened. Now in the colony, we have two mechatronics engineers, Punisher and Supergirl. This is telling me that we need more because they're basically alternating between shifts to make sure all these rails get built. But also you'll notice they're kind of pausing in between tasks because you know, well, it's cycle 1770. And I really wanted to highlight how effective the rails were, but the igneous rock is heating everything up to steam before I'm going to be able to. And they've completed the last rail segments, and I wanted to show you where the steam is right now. Because this is going to be so great. We'll go to raw mineral and say, hey, let's pick up all the igneous rock. This water is currently at 99 degrees. And very quickly, you can watch the water level just dissipate into steam. Oh, you gotta love it. That's how quick and that's how effective rail segments can be. Especially rail made out of steel. And in less than 10 seconds, the entire pool is gone. I think since we have all this nice hot igneous rock in, I believe we can actually start pumping in the polluted water. And over here where there's not atmosphere yet, you can see the temperature shift plates quickly climbing in temperature. And this is really going to help all the steam be able to pass on throughout the rest of the chamber. Oh, look at this. We have steam up here, which means we can turn our thermo aqua tuner on. Even on slow, you can see how quickly the steam is just passing on through. Such a thing of beauty. Now we're going to have to work on maintaining that temperature high enough to where it instantly turns this polluted water into steam, leaving the dirt while also not superheating the dirt into a tile of sand. We also need to make sure that we don't burn through our magma too quickly between activity sessions for this volcano. It's great having this igneous rock flowing around, but we don't want to use so much of it that we run out of magma. And our first steam turbines are coming online, and they're siphoning out the steam, and then sending all the steam over to this chamber with some freshly purified water. Not even any germs to speak of. Absolutely beautiful. So now that we have the water, we can actually connect it up to our main pipe. This segment here goes all the way over here and will relink up with what's going to be our main water spine. It'll then follow the entire base all the way to the top of the colony. The first stop it's going to take is actually going to be dumping water into our oxygen center. This entire system is basically getting revamped. The water will come directly in to the electrolyzers and then we'll move all of these pipe segments around to where the only place this polluted water is going is right here into our water purification plant. And despite my best efforts and despite there being 50 kilos of steam and pressure in here, we have one tile of polluted oxygen. 
Now it's going to take this system a long time to reach equilibrium. To start off with, we're going to be draining this entire tank. Eventually, the only thing that'll be connected to this cool slush geyser is a liquid pump, where it'll pump it directly in here. For the meantime, we may have to keep it hotter than we will normally, because we're putting so much water into it. For now, though, let's work on that main water spine before we close out the episode. Step one is going to be to fill our bristle blossom tank back up. Step two is going to be removing all the polluted water lines out of here and directly injecting the water into the electrolyzers. The great thing, though, is we can actually get rid of this water sieve, or what I call the infinite sand sink. And slowly but surely, the last of the polluted water is heading around inside of our oxygen center. We'll remove the pipes as we go. And as soon as we've used the last of the water that's coming out of this water sieve, we'll then connect our main water line directly into the electrolyzers. Additionally, this water is going to be used eventually to feed all of our sleet wheat. Right now, we have a steady source of polluted water coming all the way across our colony, heading into this water sieve, where it gets cleaned before heading into our sleet wheat. Instead, once we get this polluted water drained, we'll do the same sort of system here. Once this pipe is full, it'll start sending it over to the sleet wheat. Now, some time ago, I actually got rid of the doors and fully insulated in our entire electrolyzer setup. I like to do this towards late game when we know everything is stable, and that way we don't have temperature transfer from inside to the outside. But I'm not going to want to leave all these beautiful pipes here, so we're going to go in and remove those as well. Now, way back in the beginning of the game, we were actually using the electrolyzers and all the equipment in here to heat this polluted water, that way it wouldn't freeze in the pipes. We're not going to have to do that in the late game because all the water is going to be coming through this water purification center, getting superheated and then dumped off into here, where we're going to maintain it around 20 degrees. And here it is, the thing of beauty. The last of the polluted water is going through the water sieve. Oh, it's good to be finally off of the reliance of sand. Same thing that goes with the water sieve that was up here. The main water spine finishes up here at our rocketry program. I think that's 100% of our water sieves. I'm sure I'm forgetting one somewhere. All 16 turbines are running like a charm. Average temperature in here right now is 136, and we're maintaining about 33 kilos worth of steam pressure. And now, before I forget, we need to hook in our clean water supply into our electrolyzers. And then we can delete all the rest of the piping. And once the dupes get this all cleaned up, we can go ahead and seal it back up. I've never used a main water spine in a colony before, but I gotta tell you what, I love it. Anywhere we need water, we just plug in right into the main spine. Eventually, we're gonna tame this cool steam vent and this salt water geyser. And all we're gonna have to do is plug it right into the water purification plant in one of the available liquid vents. The magma dropper is working perfect. The AND gate with the timer sensor is doing great, and it's managed to keep the water level pretty low. Now, depending on the draw of the main water spine, which currently is only being provided by this one liquid pump, we may need to connect some of these additional liquid pumps to feed them into other areas. And eventually, I'm sure we're going to have to expand this tank here. But all in all, I think this is a resounding success. Now, I didn't think it was going to take me three recording sessions over five days, but here we are. We have a completed project that seems to be working great. I'll have another update for you in the next episode. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to hear your feedback and what you would have done differently. Until then, I had a great time. I hope you did too, and I'll talk to you soon.